how do we provide information to providers to help them provide more care, better care to members that ultimately achieves all three of those goals. It, it improves the quality of care that's received, it reduces the total cost of care for a member over their lifespan, and improves that, that, that member's experience over their lifetime, so they're achieving their own individual goals. That was Scott Vasey, Senior Vice President for Network Management at AmeriHealth Caritas. He's explaining why it's so important to focus on provider experience across the healthcare system. You're listening to How I Transform This, presented by Versus 12. Versus 12 is the award-winning Salesforce Gold Consulting Partner focused on healthcare innovation nationwide. In this episode, Scott shares his perspective on some of the themes he's seeing across the industry today, including telehealth, patient-first care, and data accuracy. He also explains how Amera Healthcare Toss is working with Versus 12 to streamline its data into one process and platform. We want to make sure that that first pass, the first engagement with a provider and the data capture, and then also data updating and contracting all happen into a single platform, then we don't have defects through the process because the process is one process. There's no, it's not handoffs to a next, the next queue of people or the next queue of technology in an application stack. It's one application stack. There's one application that's managing the end-to-end. I'm your host, Clark Buckner, and along with Versus 12 founder and CEO, Tammy Haas, each episode, we're seeking out healthcare technology industry leaders, exploring stories of success through the transformation of healthcare. For more stories like this, visit versus12.com slash podcast. Now, let's jump in. Hello, my name is Scott Vasey. I'm the Senior Vice President for Network Management at AmeriHealth Caritas. AmeriHealth Caritas is a national uh, leading Medicaid, Medicare, and, and long-term care healthcare company. We're in about 14 different states uh, providing services for um, both uh, on the managed care side as well as uh, managed pharmacy benefits and uh, behavioral health. Scott, welcome to How I Transform This. Thanks so much for taking the time to be here with us. Yes, Scott, I am so excited to have you here today. We've known each other for a while and you've got a really great story to share. So thank you again for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Tim. How about we start with the limited time I know we've got with you, I do want to hear just a quick snapshot of how you got involved in healthcare, and then we'll fast forward to where we're at today. <laughs> how I got involved in healthcare? Well, I'd, I'd love to say that my career path in healthcare was was intentional, but it wasn't. <laughs> uh, leaving school, I thought I I needed to save the world, and and uh, ended up in social work, uh, which was great. But honestly, I started. Uh, my intent going into college was uh, actually criminal justice. So when I got into social work, it was really about solving root cause and, you know, the, the, how we look at uh, people and communities, um, how we treat people in, com- in communities, uh, how we think about what we now know as social determinants. Um, and in AmeriHealth Caritas, we call them social determinants of life. So if you think about the whole person approach under social determinants of life, when I began my career in healthcare as a, as a community-based social worker, it was about managing not just a person's mental illness and access to medications, uh, access to good treatment, access to healthcare, primary care, uh, pharmacy, uh, what have you, but it was also about managing housing, uh, community supports, uh, transition supports, including up to recreational activities and things to do during your idle time. Um, one of the funny things I learned in school uh, when I was in criminal justice was a term uh, that a probation officer used. It was we don't we don't we don't rehabilitate people through criminal justice system. We habilitate system people. And I took that through social work and t- took it through my my experience um, from direct care into managed care to think about what is it that we have to do that's new for this person in the environment in which they live, the communities that surround them, that is not just about a visit to a physician's office or a visit to a hospital. It's really about how we care for that person before, during, and after, and then throughout their life. Um, and so as I moved from direct care to, to managed care, uh, my approach in managed care has always been to look at the total person and take a person-centric approach to how we work with the provider community that supports that person in the community. So, Scott, you know, if it were so simple that a 
patient could just call a doctor and that one doctor could just handle every bit of their care and they wrote a check for their care, it would probably be easy. That's basically the way our great, great, great grandparents did it. But we have ACOs and we have government entities and we have payers and we have partnerships and we have managed care organizations. And that's really complicated and it makes it very difficult to treat the patient. So tell us about some of the things that AmeriHealth Caritas is doing and what kind of led you to go to work there and use your past experience. Yeah, and it is a challenge, right? And and I've for the last 30 years I've worked in many different organizations both inside and as a consultant to thousands of healthcare organizations, payers and providers, and it's very complex and it's unique to communities, but there's a lot of similarities that cut across all aspects of healthcare in terms of its complexity. If you think about 30 plus cents of every dollar spent on the administration, in large part, that's to ensure that we actually have coordination and collaboration, and yet we fail to do that. That's sometimes related to data complexity. It's sometimes related to the patient care itself, the availability or access to that patient or the availability or access to care. And then again, as we think about whole person, how is that coordinated when you leave the healthcare ecosystem and go into the community and think about food deserts, transportation issues? How do you coordinate that within that care community? Our care needs have also changed. And what is expected of the healthcare system to deliver this person-centric approach has, has changed. And so the concept of the physician coming to your home and you're writing a check and uh, getting treated with a uh, medication or told to take you know, two aspirins, call me in the morning and three days of bed rest, that doesn't exist anymore. Healthcare is more complex. It's more advanced. And there are controls that are wrapped around that to ensure that uh, the patient's getting the right care. And then to be fair, that, that we're paying for the right care on, on the health plan side as well. Um, as we look at coordinating those systems of care, uh, it's really about data-driven approach to the people, processes, and technology that are involved in that. So the person-centric approach is driven by the data that supports them and enrichment of that data, which comes from all over the place. And that's the complexity of healthcare. You'll get the claims-based data, but you've also got the EMR-based data, which is all, all being fed into an HIE. And, and then the transparency of that data and the ability to access that data at a, at a point in care time where you can actually engage that member in making decisions about their life is the greatest challenge. And we still haven't fixed that um, in, in the United States uh, and no payer is doing it exceptionally well, but all payers are really putting a lot of effort to it because as the aggregator of that data, that, that entity that collects all that information from all over the place about the member when they're enrolled in their plan, that's their responsibility. And, and how we put that data into the provider's hands is, is critical. So, Scott, I, I first met you when you were working at an organization, My Nexus, and I think you were pretty instrumental with that organization, just as you are with AmeriHealth, in trying to figure out a better way. I've always kind of known you as a, we, it's got to be a better way kind of person to uh, solve these problems. And you're right, there's data everywhere in healthcare. So tell us specifically a little bit about what you've done in the past as it relates to technology and how you believe technology can help solve this and maybe as much as you can share about some of the specific initiatives that are being used at AmeriHealth under your leadership. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll say this. When, when, I, when I did join AmeriHealth Caritas, it was intentional. <laughs> it was probably one of the, the few intentional decisions that I had made in my life. And it was exactly for what you said, Tammy. It was, how do I take all that I've learned over the last 30 years working on both sides, or all sides, I should say, of, that, of the healthcare ecosystems and think about how we bring all of that, how, how do I bring all of that experience to AmeriHealth Caritas to really help to transform an organization that's already going through a transformation right now. Um, and so when I joined the organization, it was to say, what do I need to do to enable a provider network to be more effective and more efficient in what they do? We have a lot of great programs, but how do we bring them all and tell a story that everybody can share in as we, as we work with them? And one of the first things that, we, you know, that I looked at uh, when I came here was, well, how are we handling our provider data? Every organization, every payer organization, I should say, really struggles with the accuracy of, of provider data. Uh, it changes. It changes more frequently than you would think. 
but it also is required, you know, it's, it's required to be absolute and perfect to pay claims, to, to provide authorizations to care, to produce directories where members can search for providers. And if that's not right, that point in care approach where a member is trying to find a provider, that has to be perfect first time. And so one of the things that, that I thought a lot about and talked with our, our, our technology team about was, do we have a solution today that works for us? And we had a lot of boxed solutions, but none that actually created a, an entire workflow tool that allowed us to bring data in about a provider, enroll them in the plan, credential them, contract with them, produce directories, pay claims, and ultimately service that provider in a way that actually brought the data back to them that was consistent through the organization, not just within work silos of the organization. And they can they can see what could be possible once we get this data all together. Yeah, and for us, it's been um, phenomenal too to take a vision to reality. And um, you know, I geek out on provider network management types of issues and solutions because that is we do have a specialty in that in our in our company. But uh, it uh, it is I would say the right time and the right place and the right people to actually make that happen at AmeriHealth. So. You know, it's rewarding for us on our side. And I haven't asked you this before, but, um, and you may not have an answer for this, but are you guys considering doing anything with direct contracting with Medicare? Because I know you do Medicaid, which is almost direct contracting with the state. And now CMS is kind of moving into this direct contracting model, which is some kind of a morph from the ACO. So do you have any thoughts about that? Well, absolutely. We have to, right? The... CMS is, has made clear in bringing out the direct contracting initiative through CMMI that they want people to manage Medicare fee-for-service patients, right? That, that the Medicare fee-for-service pr- program as it's run today can't continue to, to exist. Um, it won't be able to be funded in the way that it's funded today. Cost controls aren't going to be done at the uh, clinical and, and reimbursement edit rules that CMS applies to, to paying for a claim. We have the CMS acknowledges that there's a need to get more upfront to manage care in a different way. And whether that's direct contracting through uh, a direct contract ACO or uh, I forget what they're calling them under the direct contracting model. Uh, there's another name now. Yeah, DCE. I believe. Yeah, the DCE. Thank you. The DCEs or, or through a, a managed care entity, right? It's encouraging providers and health plans to do more to manage that total person. Look at the costs within the healthcare ecosystem and think about how much of those costs are related to something other than the delivery of a service, right? So if we think about how a patient responds to uh, a diabetic treatment or uh, chronic cardiac condition treatment, other things in their lives that are influencing the amount of healthcare that they consume, that obviously CMS is a government entity can't get to that patient at a patient level or that person at a person level. And so what do we need to do to support that? If you think about the diabetic population who's on Medicaid and they get to that third or fourth week of the month and they have the money from their monthly check is run out and they're making decisions to whether or not to take their insulin or to buy food or to keep the heat on in their house, that's not something that the healthcare ecosystem is fixing right now. And, and we'll need to in the future. And that's, I think, what CMS is saying is we can't do this. And we need entities within the country to work with this on how we control the escalating costs in Medicare so that we can afford to continue to provide Medicare, Medicaid, and other services you know, for the country in, in the future. So while you were talking, I was just kind of thinking that your background in social work really plays a hand here because it, as a payer, sometimes the members they're calling in, you almost have to be a social worker to get, it's not just about the doctor and the condition and the medicine. It's about a lot of other things. Sure. And you think about the, the way that we're looking at risk. It's really about um, thinking about how the healthcare ecosystem is funded. Right. And, and if, and if the goal ultimately you know, I used to say this when I was a social worker. My job as a social worker is to work myself out of a job. If I did my job really well, I wouldn't have any patients, right? Because not, I mean, it's not curable necessarily in the mental illness world, but it's certainly treatable in a way that a patient is able to manage themselves differently and better 
in the communities in which they live that we hadn't traditionally addressed in healthcare. And now as we think about how healthcare needs to transform communities and serve people um, where they live and where they work and where they play and pray, that's what really the healthcare ecosystem has turned into. It's now a community approach that's not based on bricks and mortar, but rather based on the street and, and, and where we're engaging people and where, and where they are. You know, and I've always, I think for folks that have not really worked in the provider network management space, even if they've been in healthcare for a long time, they don't understand why it's so hard. I mean, it's, it's a provider. Why can't you get us up-to-date information? And it's complicated. Um, and we won't go into the complications of that today, but it's really at the core of everything that happens about that members care because if you don't get them to the right physician or you get them to a physician that's not in network anymore or is not covered under their plan. So your vision around the technology is just really solving some of these basic building blocks on keeping data accurate. If you think about it, you know, 85% of all healthcare dollars goes back to paying a provider. And if you can't pay that provider correctly because you don't have a right, the correct address or um, you don't have the correct tax ID or if you don't have the correct electronic funds transfer address, then that's just the start of it. The ideas of creating directories so that members can access the care or the idea that, that um, I also have to produce data dashboards back to the provider so that they know gaps in care where members need to be served and what needs are not being served today through their health care that could be addressed within the provider office or the care management organization. Uh, within an ACO, all of that has to be accurate first pass because you have to be able to get the data to the provider. That's really the, the point of contact for the patient engaging the healthcare system. And at the same time, as they're, if we're engaging them in support, in care management support, we need to be able to then make referrals to other organizations to access that care when, it, when a gap is identified as well. And so what we're doing on the Versus 12 Networks platform is allowing providers to come in and for us to push out information through a single platform that's managing all that provider through that continuum. And that's, that's, a, that's a new experience because today providers have to go here and there and everywhere to get their provider data updated or get a dashboard or to get an Excel spreadsheet of their member gaps in care, whatever it is, and doing it through a single portal environment where we can actually share that data is a different experience. Yeah, that brings up a good point. I think that in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of progress made on member experience, um, member and patient engagement and outreach, which is critically important. But now we're starting to talk about provider experience and provider engagement. That's really what you're doing there. Yep. The, the improved patient care, improved cost of care, improved patient experience. And now it's very much about improving the provider experience. What if this if this year hasn't taught us anything is that we need these folks and we need these folks not to burn out, and and obviously um, in a lot of care settings, especially in the front lines, and folks that were treating COVID patients, burnout was was rampant, and we can't have for folks burning out on us because of a pandemic or because of administrative hassles. We need to, and I don't mean to tie those two together, but they're but they're pressures that that don't add value to the continuum. And so we have to be supportive in that way. How do we provide information to providers to help them provide more care, better care to members that ultimately achieves all three of those goals? It, it improves the quality of care that's received. It reduces the total cost of care for a member over their lifespan and improves that, that, that member's experience over their lifetime. So they're achieving their own individual goals. That's the most important thing. In the world of health equity, we really have to be certain we establish what that means for each individual person and what their goals are and help them to achieve their goals. And that's not the same thing for everybody, but it's, but it's the same goal, achieve health equity and ensure that a person uh, is able to achieve those goals. So providing the tools and support, we need a provider relationship that is actually managed through a platform that allows us to do that. And so there's a lot of talk about pricing transparency and uh, patients being able to go and find providers in their network. And that is all dependent on having really good data, too. But you at AmeriHealth are creating this vision of this real-time, instantaneous provider directory information. So share a little bit of your thoughts about that and how you think that's going to be a game changer. 
Well, today, your traditional relationship with a health plan is through either a health plan representative uh, within your state or, or it may be through an IVR system. But really, the ideal state is I need to be able to go to one place, especially to manage that provider data. If my provider data isn't right, first pass, a defect at the beginning is not additive through the rest of the process. It's, it's multiplicative. And so it just multiplies as it goes through the process because the first pass was bad. And so we want to make sure that that first pass, the first engagement with a provider, and then also data updating and contracting extensioning all happen into a single platform that allows us to have, then we don't have defects through the process because the process is one process. There's no, it's not handoffs to a next, the next queue of people or the next queue of technology in an application stack. It's one application stack. There's one application that's managing the end to end. And that's, that, that's the big thing about, uh, about this being a game changer. Going back to what you said about interoperability and transparency as well. Yes, that's going to be, I mean, it's a game changer. The federal government is really pushing on interoperability of data and transparency of cost. And that, that's, not a, that's not a good or a bad thing. It's just, it's just a rational thing. Um, if we think about how we purchase any other thing that we buy, we have the ability to compare costs, compare quality, and we can do a cost comparison and think about what value we need, what we value most about that widget and make a, an informed choice a buying decision. And we haven't done that for the healthcare system yet, but it also raises some flags, right? It also makes us think about how we've constructed the healthcare ecosystem and what value we place on quality. The service costs the same to me as a member wherever I go, and, you know, unless I've got some some co co insurance or, or deductibles. Uh, but at the end of the day, I have an insurance premium that largely covers the majority of those those costs, especially if they're catastrophic, right? But that that also blinds me from the purchasing decision. And so transparency is is important to make an informed consumer choice. But now we got to think about what that means in terms of the providers whom we support and how to how to additionally support those providers that aren't capitalized like the large providers are. Uh, and ensure that you know our our, our small individ, independent practices in rural regions aren't disenfranchised by the hospital system by by transparency, and ensure that they can participate in interoperability of data, that they can receive and send data without having to sell their home to install an EMR system that connects to an AHIE to allow them to run their practice. And so uh, there's a lot that goes into interoperability and transparency, um, and there's a lot of cost to that as well. But it's the right thing to do for the ecosystem. It's just a matter of getting through it. And I think that the the recent federal, uh, well, they're not recent. They've been part of the Cures Act and other acts um, for a number of the HIPAA Cures Act and, and other acts for a number of years. They're just coming to finally coming to fruition and going live in 2021 and the next two years. But as we make our way through these, uh, these rules that have been set for us, um, it's doing what we've all been saying all along. And that's we, we have to make this uh, easier to work with. Yeah, and you guys are well on your way of doing that. Yes, yeah, yeah. We've got we've got a lot a lot of work going on right now, and and quite honestly, not scared of it. Um, it's because it's the right work to do. I think with you, Scott, one of the most interesting guests perspectives that we've had in a while from your background with social work. It's very interesting, and you. Of course, we're talking earlier about these different concepts of social determinants of health, and you described it: social determinants of life. And as we talk about data, it's everywhere now, and we're talking about telling a story through data and making improvements through all of this. I'm curious, one of our last questions for you, while we still have you for just another couple minutes, anything else that's on your mind or on your heart as you're thinking about the future, while you're thinking about the art of what is possible, what is on your mind? You know, one of the things that is on my mind and I think about a lot right now, aside from interoperability and transparency, aside from the move from fee-for-service to value and risk and the integration of data between health systems and payer aggregators of data, holders of risk, relationships with state contracts, those kind of things, is going to get me a little bit into the weeds here, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. And that's just the aspect of telehealth, right? And how much telehealth has taken a, a more of a front seat during the COVID pandemic 
and what the long-term impact of that is as well. We have a problem with physician resources in this country. There's just not enough of them. And we have a problem with accessing care and getting to that member. And I don't know that we actually completely understand the impact of continued telehealth support by CMS and, and by payers um, in, the, in the long-term future. I think, it's, I think it's a good thing and it's an important thing. Right. And, and telehealth extends not just the, you know, you, you pull up your computer and you get log into an app and you see a physician and you talk about your symptoms. If you've got an urgent care need and it's after hours and you've got kids at home and you, who have a fever kind of thing, it's and, and, and that's you know, sort of the ED avoidance stuff. It's, it's actually you know, remote technologies that allow us to monitor patients, blood sugars and, and heart rate and blood pressure and weight and that sort of stuff. It's uh, virtual rehabilitation programs that allow us to rehabilitate through physicians or physical therapist guided activities. It, it's all of that. And if we have reduced capacity in our, in our healthcare system and an increased need in our population, how do we connect those two by providing scale through additional telehealth services without telehealth services taking away from the people-based approach that we've become so comfortable with? I enjoy talking to my primary care physician. Uh, I consider him a friend. You're not going to replace my primary care physician with it with a telehealth visit, I'll tell you now. But at the same time, if I can't get to my primary care physician after hours and and have an urgent but not emergent need that I think that can be resolved through, um, you know, through a, a, a phone call or, or a telehealth presence support mechanism, or I have a chronic condition that could be better managed through remote patient monitoring um, and, and working with my physician on managing my blood sugar better because I've got a, a monitor that's uh, feeding him or her data or information. That's encouraging. But where does it replace the physician to patient relationship is, is also something we have to keep in mind. And as with anything in the healthcare system, when, when does the waste come in? When does too much telehealth support no longer actually make sense? And to that end, not all of our populations can engage in this model. And we don't want to discriminate based on income level, our ability to access care because I don't have a computer that supports uh, or I don't, I'm I'm out of minutes on my, uh, or I'm out of data on my cell phone, or um, I don't have in in the community in which I live, I don't have broadband. Um, And so it's, it's how do we make that accessible to all? And at the same time, understand the limitations of what we can, can be delivered through it. So just another thought that I, that I think about. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, you are definitely positioned in a place to make change. I love how you're driving transformation in healthcare. I loved hearing the examples of some of the work that you and Tammy have already been doing, and I'm sure there's more on the horizon. So with that, I just want to say thank you for joining us. Tammy, is there anything else you want to leave us with? No, this is... Yeah, this is fantastic. You've got all kinds of vision around how this can work and how we can be better as an ecosystem in healthcare and at the payer and the provider level and better serve the patient, which is why we're all here. And uh, so thank you so much for sharing that today. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. And thanks for all the work that your team's doing. And I appreciate you inviting me today. Thanks for listening to How I Transform This, Success Stories of Transformation in Healthcare. Presented by Versus 12. To learn more about how Versus 12 is best situated to transform the healthcare industry and to follow along with this show, be sure to visit Versus12.com slash podcast. We'll see you next time.